Welcome to Elixir Mix, your weekly Elixir podcast talking with members of the community. My name is Mark Erickson. On our panel today, we have Josh Adams. True. <laughs> and today we're joined with a special guest, uh, Mitchell Hanberg. Mitchell, can you say hi? Hey, how's it going, guys? Excellent. And, and uh, could you just give, uh, for people who are uh, just meeting you for the first time, could you give a little introduction and kind of background about what you do and, and why you're here? Sure. Um, my name is Mitchell Hanberg. I'm a software developer from Indianapolis, Indiana. I work for a uh, software product design and development company called SEP. We're based in Carmel, Indiana. Um, and currently, I don't actually write any uh, Elixir at work, but worked on a Rails project, so I'm uh, satisfied with that. So if you're not doing Elixir at work, are you doing it at home? Yeah, so... Probably about, I think, October of 2017, I was like, it's right when I was starting to get into having a side project in college, that was the last thing I ever wanted to think about. Mm -hmm. But um, at, at SCP, we have a big like professional development sort of mindset and culture. So I kind of got caught with that bug and I, I did a little Rails project and then I heard someone at work say something about elixirs and channels and phoenix and when i realized the syntax was sort of similar to to ruby i decided i'd check it out so i wrote a giant like json api with like a it ended up having like a react and a little bit of elm front end but so that's where i really really got uh, caught on to elixir um and since then, I've done a lot of uh, advent of code projects with Elixir and actually recently rewrote a small internal tool at, at my company written in Phoenix. So I was pretty excited to actually get that launched and deployed. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So awesome. is, is the, uh, I don't know, the, the company open to the idea of like, you know, uh, internal tools are low risk. But are they open to the idea of like, hey, let's let's try different tech? Is that something that you see at your company? Yeah, de definitely. Uh, mostly, a lot of our projects are a lot of the our clients come in with tech that they already work with. So a lot of times we use whatever they're doing. So, and we're pretty old-ish company for software. We just had our thirtieth anniversary. Wow. So coming up uh we have a lot of like dot net type stuff and i recently just came off a year-long project that was purely a react front end thing so well so you get to Can't touch get a lot a, of different tech yeah nice and so i know you've been playing with elixir and uh you wrote a blog post not too long ago about uh, that was featured in Elixir Weekly. I just wanted to kind of give a plug for Elixir Weekly. It is a, uh, like if you go to, a lot of the, this stuff comes from the uh, Elixir status, like at Elixir status, Twitter tag, post things there. There's a website, Elixir, uh, Elixir status. And uh, so yeah, it kind of brings together a lot of different features and, and articles and things and you were featured there. And so this article, you were talking about how to use Elixir LS with Vim. And so I think it's a good place to start with probably just like, what is Elixir LS? Like, can you give us like an introduction to what that is? Yeah, so 
Elixir LS is what's known as a language server, which is a sort of standard popularized by uh, the VS Code Microsoft editor using their language server protocol um, spec that they made. And pretty much a language server is totally separate thing from your editor. So you'll have a client, which is usually integration with an editor. And then the server, which is what Elixir LS is, uh, will, um, the whole, the spec is based on JSON RPC, which is like JSON remote procedure call. So it kind of accepts like HTT packets, but in the special format and pretty much send it your code. It does analysis on it. In the case of Elixir LS, I think it actually compiles it and runs some like special, it might do some like beam file analysis, but then it, so it sends that back to your editor and then whatever integrate and editor integration you have will then present it into the editor itself to show you like uh, what they call like diagnostic things, which are like compiler errors or suggestions or things like that. And so Elixir LS is the, at this point, the uh, premier Elixir language server. Yeah, so I'll put a, a link to Elixir LS just so people can be aware of the project and some of the features it has. Um, just like to, to tick off a few of the ones that you'd kind of mentioned that I think are, are really helpful. And it's it is like uh, debugger support. You know, like if I say I want to have a breakpoint and I want to step and step over, step into that kind of feature uh, versus um, like go to definition, uh, code formatting, documentation lookup on hover, you know, so it's, it's a lot of those things that's, it, I think it, it really is a testament, I guess, to Microsoft's idea of like building tools, right? That they're building something that is a language server that says, I, I, I know how to answer questions about a, a programming language and its runtime and, uh, and the code that you've given me. And then that's completely separate from an editor. And so, yeah, you're, it's like you'd mentioned how like, Okay, Elixir LS was kind of, or the language server uh, that the protocol that Microsoft has kind of developed was really for um, v, uh, VS Code, Visual Studio Code. And, but you're, you're trying to bring it into something completely different, right? You're trying to bring it into your editor of choice, presumably, uh, which is Vim. So like, wh where did that come from? And like, you're like, uh, yeah, I want to see if I can make that happen. Like, tell, what's that story like? Yeah, so the uh, Vim plugin that I use for all of my formatting and linting and everything is this uh, really, really amazing project called AIL, which stands for Asynchronous Linting Engine. Um, so that integrates into standard linters like RuboCop or Credo, um, but then also acts as the language server protocol uh, client. And for a while I had, because I, I also about a year ago is when I really started using Vim. And then ever since then, I couldn't go back to anything else. So I really wanted to use the, the language server, but I just could not use VS code anymore. Um, so there, there were a couple other plugins for Vim. One is called Vim LSP. Another one is called Language Client NeoVim um, that could be uh, integrations for language servers, but because they work for so many and uh, the, the installation instructions just weren't really that clear, I could never get it to work the way I want, which is primarily um, like tab completion and go to definition and stuff. Um, so as I was doing that, I was really losing steam and I just wanted to give up. But then I see on Twitter, or no, it was on GitHub actually, I was, I was monitoring the, the ale repo religiously to see, see if anyone was gonna do it. Um, so then this person name, I'm probably not saying this right, but John Paris, he submitted a pull request to add the ale um, Elixir LS integration for Vim. So as soon as that got merged in, I upgraded and 
pretty much as I was getting it installed and up and running, I was writing the blog post at the same time because I was so excited. Um, so then once I was, I had confirmed that I got it up and running and I could use it minimally is when I just immediately published it because I needed as many people to know about this as possible. <laughs> nice. Natural advocacy. Yep. So Josh, I, uh, I believe you are a Vim fan as well. Is that correct? Yes, I'm a pretty substantial Vim zealot, but this year I'm trying out other editors for the sake of not stagnating. So for instance, doing, um, doing Flutter specifically, I always use VS Code now. And uh, you know, it, it does make me want to make my Elixir Vim integration better. Um, so far I've not set up Elixir LS, but that's actually why I've been a little quiet. I've been, I've been setting it up over here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you'll have to give us some real-time feedback as to how it goes. By the end of the end of the show, you'll be able to say, "I've got it," or "I don't." <laughs> yeah, so far I updated a uh, a theme, and now my Vim looks stupid. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's I think the I don't know. It seems to me like the language holy war or the, like the editor holy war is kind of like died down. I think it's just maybe I just don't follow those channels, you know. But uh, it'll never die down. <laughs> I've just become very pragmatic. Um, I've used a lot of different tools. I, you know, I've, I've come up through development starting back in, you know, basic uh, with DOS. Um, so it's like, I don't know. My personal preference is I, I don't use Vim. Uh, it's just not, not the way I like to interact with my code, like with that way, like with modes. Um, but I don't have any problem with anyone else doing it. Just don't ask me to sit down on your keyboard and type. <laughs> I feel no. like the um oh sorry. No, go ahead. I feel like the uh the quote unquote holy war, like you said, has died down, but it's more like everyone else is just more is just quieter, but the people who like VS Code really, really like VS Code. Not that they don't like anything else, they're mm -hmm. just very, very excited excited and uh, emphatic about VS Code. <laughs> That's interesting. Do you use VS Code for development? No, I primarily just use Vim. I used it long, probably like a year and a half ago when, like I said, I was first um, getting into having side projects. Because at that point at work, I had I'd only been, I graduated in 2016, so I had only been like on the job for like nine months. And at that point, I'd only used like normal Visual Studio with um, C Sharp. So I really hadn't even used any other editor in a long time. So I kind of like entered it with a blank slate and saw this thing, Visual Studio Code. And just because I was working with C Sharp, I was like, oh, I can, I can work with C Sharp and I don't have to have Visual Studio on my computer. Yep. Nice. So it looks like uh, on the Elixir LS uh, GitHub page, which is in the show notes, you can see that they have IDE plugins for Visual Studio Code, Atom, IDE, and Vim. Um, but it is, it, they do show like they do not have uh, debugger or spec suggestions implemented yet on Atom and Vim. It's so, like I'm one of those guys where, like, I don't know, I'm, I came back, I grew up through the, the time and I was a developer through the time when Microsoft was very antagonistic to anything open source, to Linux that was a cancer. You know, so I, I still have a lot of mistrust of Microsoft. But give, having said that, I use VS Code currently. I've, I've been switching to it and uh, it's, it's not terrible. It's, it's actually, it, there's some things I'm not, uh, a total fan of and I have to add plugins to make it more usable. But uh, yeah, I think it's a great tool and it's open source. So I, I think it's something people, it's worth people trying out, especially if you're wanting to get, you know, trying like this, um, like this Elixir LS backend for doing more intelligent Elixir um, code completion insights. I haven't tried the debugging yet. I should try that. <laughs> Yeah, it's another thing I haven't uh, been able to do just because I've just been using Vim. Yeah, have you have you seen Oni Vim? I have 
seen it and I have downloaded it and but that was a very quick five minutes. Yeah, I, I used it and I think it's really interesting and I hope it becomes more usable. Uh, but the language server support was really nice. And what was that called? Onivim? It's Onivim, O-N-I-V-M. It's a front end for NeoVim. Um, so it's sort of like if you had your Vim inside of something like VS Code, but it's actually Vim. It's not some emulation layer. Oh, cool. So it's, it's like a really good example of, hey, we could actually make this into a modern thing. Yeah, so just since we're, since we're talking about Vim anyway, I thought I would mention, I, I know you had said right before I dropped off that uh, you, were, you didn't really like the modal nature of it. Uh, the thing that I love about it and the thing that kind of makes me an open source sell it is I know 25 years from now, if I want to run Vim, I can run Vim. Um, that's true. And I'm sure that's it'll true. Work like I want it to. So like none of my muscle memory will ever go away ever, ever. <laughs> um, and I don't, I mean, it's certainly a toss up whether five years from now we're running VS code. Right. Um, anyway, so, but probably. Yep. Yeah. What are the issues I've kind of had and I haven't, I hate to even say it because I, I can't say for certain where the problem is, but I have problems with, I have VS code open on multiple projects at the same time. And like one of them is an umbrella project and one of them is not. And, and sometimes it's just the Elixir LS just keeps crashing. And so it's like, it just doesn't give me any insight. So I've hesitated to like write up a blog post and kind of show like, Hey, this is how you can do Elixir development in VS code until I actually know that it works well for me. But uh, yeah, so hopefully I, I, I do watch uh, and hope that, that maybe there's just some configuration I need to fix. Maybe it's just a, a, an issue with my project. So some things I still need to look into. Yeah, I'm not really sure how per or performant Elixir LS is for like a really, really big project or maybe an umbrella project. I imagine that's maybe a little bit larger. Um, but I do know that if you clone the actual Elixir language repo and then open it with Elixir LS, uh, your computer will start to melt. <laughs> awesome. That's really good to know. <laughs> yeah, Josh doesn't want that now that he's have his, having his computer serviced because the battery was expanding. Well, and the reason <laughs> I dropped a second ago is because my, uh, my desktop crashed. I'm pretty sure my RAM is bad. Oh, no. Fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, so enough about that though. So, okay, so do you want to tell me how roughly building the integration between AOL and Elixir LS is, how, how that goes? Yeah, so um, in the AOL project, you pretty much, from what I understand, is you add a new file in the appropriate directory called whatever your integration is, and then there's sort of just like a configuration. Like you have to tell it like where the LSP is located, um, what the name of it is, maybe some other options. Like I know right now you can, for the dialyzer integration with uh, Elixir LS, there's a AL option to turn it off by default. Awesome, thank you. Um, but for your actual editor, um, all you really need to do is have Elixir LS installed. And then um, there's one variable you have to set in your VimRC, which is um, the, the path to wherever the, there's this, when you build Elixir LS, there's this um, essentially start bash script and you have to like point it to the directory where that is, and then AL will start it up. But if you don't have that installed, AL won't start any linters or language servers that you don't already have installed. So there's no like extra stuff that will slow you down. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. 
I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash elixir. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. So were you able to use, um, when you were previously doing like uh, React development, presumably you're maybe using Vim, were you able to use AL to give you like uh, JavaScript linting or anything like that? Uh, sadly not because my team were actually using, uh, IntelliJ. Okay. Um, even though there is another like WebStorm one, which is I think technically better for like JavaScript, but IntelliJ is the like kind of catch all. Um, but the Vim key bindings for IntelliJ are surprisingly really good. So I was able to maintain my um, Vim skills while at work. Nice. Yeah, I've used IntelliJ before, uh, specifically when I was doing a lot of uh, Ruby development, because uh, mm -hmm. RubyMine was like the, the uh, JetBrains flavored uh, I, IDE. Um, and that really, it worked, worked really well for doing Rails development, like, you know, integrated debugger, and it was uh, a big power feature for me. So yeah, I... I think they have good tooling. So yeah, I'm, the, uh, oh, sorry. Go on. I'm just curious if you have any more Elixir projects or things that you're thinking about and where you want to go next with kind of your playing around exploring Elixir. Yeah, so uh, currently I have a couple things on my mind. Um, I want to continue to write about Elixir and um, just keep working with it. Right now I have the idea for either a series of blog posts or small, really short screencasts of just working through the Elixir standard library and sort of explaining what a lot of the different functions do or some of the more, um, I don't wanna say rare modules, but some things that there probably isn't a whole lot of examples of online and just how to use it. All right, so I do have one question. What is the best feature of Elixir LS uh, usable via AL? What's the thing that when you install it, you're gonna go like, yeah, I totally needed that? Uh, for me, it's mostly the um, auto tab completion as you type. That's one of the things that I missed about when I was working on like a C-sharp Visual Studio project is you really don't need to like look at the docs that much um, yeah. because just like as you, with C-sharp, it's static types though, well, quote unquote static types. So it's a little bit easier to like hit dot and then see all the enumerable or link functions that you can use. Um, so with, with my experience with, um, so right now I'm on a Rails project, so I wanted to use the Ruby um, language server, which right now the, I think the best one is called Solar Graph. Um, and that works okay. But the thing is, while Ruby and Elixir are both dynamically typed, um, since Elixir is functional and just has modules and everything is pretty much like absolute namespaced at all times, it's a lot easier for like you type enum dot and then it just drop down of all the, all the enum functions Whereas if you're in Ruby and I think it would work if you use like this one documentation library where you give things like type specs, essentially like a little, um, uh, like interfaces, then it can kind of infer and be like, you know, you can hit dot and then it's like, Oh, I know this is a string. So I'll show you the string things. But if you don't do that, it's, it's not really that powerful. So, Luckily with Elixir and the module namespacing, it's, it's pretty nice just for enum dot whatever or gen server dot whatever. Yeah, and I'm also hopeful that people using something like the Elixir language server would encourage more uh, thoughtful use of specs. I will say one thing, um, like I use ASDF for managing my Elixir and Erlang libraries versions, like the versions that are installed. 
And I will say that uh, for the Visual Studio Code, VS Code, Elixir LS plugin, it wants to have, it needs to have in order to do dialyzer kind of specs where it can say, hey, this doesn't match the return type of what you said it's calling, that kind of a thing. Uh, it has to have where the, the version of Elixir is compiled with a specific version of Erlang. And I just want to mention that as uh, for uh, you, dear listener, who might be trying to do this and, and not seeing why this is happening. Visual Studio Code will give you a little, little uh, pop-up in the window that says, hey, this needs to be compiled with it. If you're using something like ASDF, I just want to mention that there is a version of Elixir that you can install that is compiled with specific OTP versions. So just be aware that that exists. You can go look for it and install that, and then the dialyzer stuff works. Yeah, for the nice. uh, for the Vim integration, I've noticed. So when you when you use it with Vim, you have to actually clone the Elixir LS repo and then run a um, like a mixed task to build it. And the way that I had installed it was I just I have like a development folder, so I just cloned it there and built it there. And then in my Vim RC, I just pointed um, Vim to where that was. But when I was switching between projects, I would notice that it just wasn't working on one of the projects. And I had someone who read my blog post tweet at me. And I think this was like my confirmation that I think there's some weirdness with you need to compile Elixir LS with the same Erlang and Elixir version as the project you're in. That doesn't seem like it should be the case based on the documentation, but in practice, that's what I've found to be true. So I was curious as to one of your favorite features um, of Vim, just that you enjoy, like, that you said, like, once I went to Vim, I couldn't go back. Like, if you were to give, like, a little, you know, advocacy, like, this is why you should try Vim, like, what would be your kind of pitch? Well, for me, kind of in uh, contrast to what you said about Vim, for me, it's really the modal editing, which is the, it's really the main feature, I think, and it's also the best. I just like moving my hands and my wrists as little as possible, so I like... Um, it works really great. You can just keep them on home row. You don't ever have to move to the arrow keys. I like to have a nice, like I have a really tiny keyboard for my computer. So, and then a trackball mouse. So like, I don't have to move my arm that much. Um, I really think after I learned Vim, it's really increased my development speed and not even with just the speed, but the mental capacity that I have to keep for entering the things into the keyboard. Um, now I can use a lot of that for thinking about the problems and not just editing text. Yeah, so I think Vim gives you better primitives for thinking about changing your code. That's that's how I feel. Like, I feel exactly like you said. Well, good. I'm glad you guys agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's decided by democracy. Mark is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the things I just kind of feel bad about, like, we, there's a lot of people like in the Utah area, there's a, a lot of people coming out of like these, you know, tech kind of boot camp kind of things. And they're learning, they're kind of newer to programming in general. Um, I don't know what your path was, M Mitchell, uh, but like I, I imagine, you know, you, you then throw somebody uh, at this kind of statement of like, oh, well, you really should be doing it in Vim. You know, it's like, oh, now I have to go back and relearn an editor, like how I even like put text into the computer. So I don't want people to, like feel overwhelmed by anything like that. Like, yeah, I agree. I think, I think somebody new to it should use VS code. Like I don't feel uncomfortable at all saying that I, I would, I would rather not say, okay, well you'd like to learn a program first. Let me teach you how we pretend we're talking to a teletype. <laughs> yeah. I would also not recommend learning them if you're also new to programming. When I was in school, a lot of our projects were, it was for this, this tiny operating system called Xenu, which is Unix backwards. It was written by one of the professors. But the way we had to do our homework and turn in the assignments was we had to SSH to these to to the actual little Linksys routers that it ran on. And 
we all use Vim, but none of us, this is before I really knew Vim, like the culture thing. And I didn't know any in the modal editing. I would just hit I, well, figure out which key turns into insert mode, which I know now is I, and then use the arrow keys and only have one file open at a time because I didn't know about tabs or buffers or anything like that. And then have the connection break and then have swap files like corrupted swap files and that is, I could barely handle that in school. So I definitely would not recommend uh, all that mental overhead if you're already trying to learn how to program. Yeah, I just, I just want people to realize like, that's okay, don't worry about that. But be aware that these exist and when you're like comfortable with your language, you know, like wanting to explore something else, there's also Emacs, there's Vim, there's, uh, like a number of different editors and they all have their own different kind of key bindings that they set up. And the so, new one, the, there's a new conceptually like a data structure called the rope. And um, there's a, I forgot the name of it now. It's like called she or something, XI, I think. But uh, I'm really interested in that generally because that's going to make something like Vim, but collaborative actually makes sense. Good story, good story. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to drop a link to that. I just tried Googling for it and I was not finding it. So yeah, I think it's a, an experimental yeah, called, thing by GitHub. Uh, I think Google. Google? Yeah. Uh, a Google employee, I'm pretty sure. Here, I, I posted a link to it. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. It's also yeah. possible I'm wrong. Editor. Uh, written in Rust. That's, that's very, uh, I don't know, hip right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a Google is listed as a contributor. Fun. Yeah. Well, there, there are a lot of different ways that we can get our code out of our brain into a, a computer. And I just think it's great that, uh, that people are learning and, and, and coming to it and bringing, you know, that the Elixir community is growing. I'm great. I'm glad that Mitchell comes on, writes blog posts, shares with the people, shares with the world, hey, this is how you can do something cool that I'm excited about. Just sharing what you're excited about is awesome. And uh, so we'll have a link to your blog, co your blog post as well. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about before we uh, switch to picks? I'm good. All right, let's switch to picks. Josh, do you have anything that you'd like to share? I do, and I'm excited about it. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of Urbit before. Um, it is from uh, a guy that caused a lot of controversy around Lambda Conf in 2016 uh, because Lambda Conf let him speak uh, after he was accepted by their blind panel that's supposed to be unbiased and then everybody got mad that he was allowed to speak. Anyway, but uh, so it's, it is, I, I put a link to what they call the primer, which does a very, has a video that does a very good job of explaining it, but it's basically conceptually a personal computer that lives on sort of a blockchain, but is unlocked by your seed or whatever. Um, and it's its own virtual machine programming language, um, operating system and services around it to try to break the data silos that we create when like, say you go on Facebook and now all of your baby pictures forever have been uploaded to Facebook and they own that data or that, you know, they have that data and you don't have it. Um, anyway, so the idea is to make it possible for you to grant access to people in your personal computer space. But to get there, they basically uh, reinvented the computing thing. So that's kind of neat. Uh, anyway, but it's really, really cool. It's been going on since like 2002 or something ridiculous. He's been working on it, but um, it's at a very, it's at a very cool spot now. So go check it out. It's really cool. If you just like seeing crazy stuff. That is interesting. I'm I have a friend who I think will be very interested in this. I'll have to pass him that link. So thanks for that recommendation. Awesome. I was going to share uh, a tool that I'd really like to use. It's called YouTube DL. So it is, is for downloading uh, local copies of YouTube videos. Um, what I like about it is like, if there's a YouTube video that I really like, sometimes I'll, uh, just pull it down and host it on uh, like my home Plex media server because my kids might just want to keep playing it and I don't necessarily want them browsing all of YouTube. And so that's an option. 
but I, you can also use it with some different flags to just say, hey, download this and just turn it into an MP3 file, drop all the video. And I like to do that too, because like you can find artists who will post things like music, musical mixes, like that are not really anywhere else. They're just doing their own custom mixes and you can find those on YouTube and I can say, hey, I'd like to be able to play that again. So YouTube DL, just one of the tools I like to use. It's this command line tool. And Mitchell, do you have a, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, so I just finished reading a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. It's a really interesting take on uh, what it takes for to be successful. Uh, he, he claims that prolonged periods of non-distraction is really necessary for uh, getting really good at something and being successful um, in your career. Uh, and he just gives a bunch of examples of um, like old philosophers and writers and like uh, Bill Gates and those, those types of uh, major success stories and how they've uh, achieved all their success. And then also the new reading that on the new Kindle Paperwhite, which I just got for my birthday. So it's a great piece of technology. Was that the Paperwhite? Oh, you just dropped a link to it. Awesome. Yes. So is that, uh, so that looks like a nice screen, like uh, you can read in daylight. Yeah. So it's the same as the old Kindle, but now, well, my last Kindle was from like 10 years ago. So very basic, but so for the, to me, the, the new things are, it has the backlight, which is really, really good because it allows me to read in bed without straining my eyes on my phone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this one's also waterproof, which is good for if you're going to the beach, I guess. Nice. Before I've, I've just dropped it into like a Ziploc bag. <laughs> yep. I have made the mistake of running into the water with my phone in my pocket. No. Oh, yep. Ocean water is really bad for phones. <laughs> well, awesome, Mitchell. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you today. If people would like to follow you online or connect with you, where should they go to do that? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter. It's just at Mitch Hamburg. And then my GitHub is at M Hamburg. And then you can also visit my website, which is mitchellhanberg.com. It's where I blog and such. Great. Uh, well, that's it for today. Uh, we hope you'll join us next week on Elixir Mix. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.